It's open. Dr. Majo, you're welcome, sir. Take over, sir. Thank you so much, Pastor Light Eze. I'm always blessed by these programs, and especially the prayer we pray together in these programs. I'd like to greet everyone that is on the platform. It's a great work that we are doing, a work for which you are going to be rewarded. Let's make sure that we put in our best. Let's make sure that we apply whatever we have learned. And from my experience, I know that what God is doing is building a great army, an army that the devil is afraid of. Amen. This evening, we are going to discuss the issue of unreached people all over the world. This is an issue that the mainline church is afraid of because mm -hmm. the church prefers to reach out to those areas that are known mm -hmm. as viable fields. Mm -hmm. A viable field is a field where you reap rewards soon after you enter. Rewards in number of souls and rewards in amount of money that will be returning from such a field. Most churches prefer to go to viable fields. But Jesus is calling us in these last days to ensure that the people he died for in their different locations, in their different geopolitical areas are actually reached. And that's a challenge for the work of God in this generation. That we must stop talking about viable fields and start looking at where the gospel has not yet reached. And that is part of what we are about to talk about this evening. May the Lord help us to make impact in whatever is teaching us today impact that we reach out to the kind of work we are doing all over the world and the kind of people we are reaching out to. Let us pray. Father, we bless your name for your goodness and for your mercies. Lord, it is because of your mercies that we are not consumed. Yes, sir. Tonight, as we talk about unreached people, we pray, Lord, that you will help us. Give us understanding of what you are saying. Let it be that the impact you make upon us tonight will affect the work that we are doing in such a way that many more souls will be won in places that are yet unreached. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. So our topic tonight is the compassion of the sons of God for unreached people groups. Compassion for unreached people groups. And to introduce this topic, I want to say that it's been over 2,000 years since the church has worked hard in the area of soul winning. But the impact assessment of this work shows that only a portion of the world has been targeted and won. Only a portion of the world is receiving the attention of the church, while other sections of the world are totally ignored. As a result, while some parts of the world have been over-bombarded, over-saturated with the gospel, we have about 27.9% mm -hmm. of the world that comprise of over 2 billion people, group, people in 6,500 people groups that are yet unreached. Many of them have actually not heard the name of Jesus Christ before. These people are cut off from any access to the gospel, and they are largely ignored by the church or unknown to the Christian world. And sadly, nearly 90% of the missionary workforce, all the laborers, all the missionaries we have, about 90% of them are targeting areas that are already reached. The average church today will send a missionary to an area where every other building is already a church. The average church today is not interested in sending a missionary to a place where Jesus has not been mentioned. Why? Because of the difficulties of assessing 
on rich peoples. And I'm going to mention those difficulties shortly. The same is true of the money that the church has for the issue of soul winning. Most of the money of the church is sent to areas where the gospel has saturated and is avoiding areas where the gospel has not yet reached. News even has it that globally, Christians spend more money on dog food than they spend on missions. Mm. Can you imagine that? That anomaly? Mm. That all over the world, the money that Christians spend on their dogs is more than the money they put into the work of missions. Not to talk about the work of missions to the unreached. So when we talk about the unreached, we are referring to that unfinished missional task. That is, the people groups in our various countries who are yet to be reached with the gospel. And as things are, every country has its own share of unreached people. So part of this exercise tonight is to encourage and persuade each and every one of us after today to put your mind back to the issues of missions in your own country, to search and to research the issue of unrich people in your own country, and to begin to do something about them, beginning by making it a discussion point. Unrich people is a discussion that most church leaders don't want to engage in because they're afraid of the consequences of God convincing them to target the unreached. It's not an easy task. Like you're going to hear some stories from my own personal experiences tonight. Psalm 2 verse 8. Psalm number 2 verse 8. God says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the hidden for thy inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. So God is willing to help us reach the unreached. And what we are here to learn tonight is how we can go ahead and do this thing that God wants us to do. So quickly, I will jump ahead to look at the unreached people groups, both in Nigeria and in Africa. I come from Nigeria, so please don't mind my you know, making a lot of emphasis on what is happening in Nigeria. That's my point of my point of a connection. So in Nigeria, the number of unreached people groups, according to Joshua Project, Joshua Project is a website on missions, on missionary uh, statistics. So according to Joshua Project, the number of unreached people groups in Nigeria are 90 out of a total of 541 people groups in my country. These unreached people number about 62.95 million people out of Nigeria's population of 223 million. The more popular among the unreached people groups in Nigeria are the Kanuris, the Hausas, and the Fulanese. I'm sure many of us are familiar with the Hausas and the Fulanese, especially the Fulanese, because of their, their, their riotous, lifestyle and their escapades for the devil in Africa. However, amongst the list of the unreached people groups, there are many others that are not often mentioned. There are the Shangawas who are found in uh, Dendi, somewhere up north in Nigeria. There are the Bagudo and the Yaori. These are local government areas in Kebi state of Nigeria where the Shangawas reside. Then you also have the Buduma people group who live in the, in the, in the shores of Lake Chad. They live in the Yobe state and the Mbauchi state of Nigeria. You have the Butawas people group who live in Mbauchi state of Nigeria. And some of them also live in Kwara state of Nigeria. You have the Bashas. These ones are found in Plateau state of Nigeria. You have the Achipawas that live in Kebi State and the Niger State of Nigeria. You have the Bisa, who live in Niger State, and the Kutin that are found in Adamawa State, all of them in Nigeria. Then in Africa, the number of unreached people groups, according to Joshua Project, is 991 
out of a total of 3,701 people groups. These unreached people, they number about 374.7 3, million people out of Africa's population of about 1.5 trillion. Among the worst of such unreached people in Africa are the Turej, who number about 3 million in eight countries, and they comprise of 16 ethnic groups. Then there are the Fulbe of Fulani, who number about 20 million people in 40 ethnic groups. They are the largest nomadic people in the whole world. The houses are about 30 million in population, and you find them in about 27 countries in Africa. Then we have the Kushaitic people of the Horn of Africa. 55 million they are in over 140 ethnic groups, living in Sudan, in Eritrea, in Ethiopia, and in Somalia. These are unreached people in the different areas of Africa. I want us to quickly look at the challenges of taking the gospel to these unreached people, or rich tribes, both in Nigeria and in Africa. These challenges will lead us to the issue of discussing the solution. And that's where the issue of compassion will be discussed. So let, let's first of all look at the challenges of reaching them. A look at every map of unreached people groups, whether in Nigeria or in Africa, would immediately show that they are always clustered in the north. And the north is an area dominated by fundamentalist Islamic communities. Every north in Africa, every north in most African countries. That's where you find the fundamentalists. That's where you find the naysayers to Christ. That's where you find most of the unreached people groups. As of today, Islam, which is in Northern Nigeria and in Northern Africa, presents itself as the most dominant and the greatest opposition to the work of Christian missions all over the world. In Nigeria and in Africa, where the practice of democracy is not very well developed, Islam stands as an outright hindrance to reaching the unreached, especially in states or countries where Sharia is practiced. Be that as it may, I personally have this conviction that Islam will self-destruct both in Nigeria and in Africa, and it is going to happen. It is instructive to know that the Church of Christ has never been defeated from outside, never been destroyed by external forces in all of history. Anything that ever affected the church came from inside the church. Forces that are external to the church have never destroyed the church. It is the weakness of the church that begins to dismember it. But any time the church has understanding and, and runs to God, no force in history, no force, no power has ever been able to defeat the church. So it is ungodliness, immorality, worldliness. These are often the factors and the powers that send the church into a state of coma, at which time opposing and satanic forces begin to thrive. However, times of refreshing and revival will always come from the Lord to set the church back on its feet and to give Christian missions the power to penetrate even the worst unreached locations and liberate unreached people groups to join the worship of the eternal God. Like I said, I have stories to tell of how God has used the issue of compassion in the ministry that I serve with to reach the worst of the unreached peoples. One of them is a place called Ibwa, somewhere about two hours from Abuja. Ibwa is a location that is totally Muslim. In fact, there was only one Christian from that whole community. As at the time we went to that community, only one Christian. And that Christian resided in Abuja. Then when he heard that some very mad people wanted to take the gospel to his community, he decided to come home to find out how it would go. Because to go into a Muslim community 
a community that is 100% Islam, and you're going to preach the gospel. In Nigeria, the word for that is suicide. But it was compassion that took us there. Here is a community where all that the government can do for them is to build mosques. They had the worst of roads. They had no amenities. Food was scarce. The government was using government money to build more and more mosques inside the location. The people were suffering. And when we heard about them, we decided to take the gospel to them. By the grace of God, the mission I work with, that is called Missions Aid International, is a mission that works with compassion. So anywhere we're going to, we don't just go empty-handed. We go with free Medicare. We go with free vocational training. We go with foodstuffs. We go with clothing. We go with everything that could help. We do community development projects, like putting boreholes. Sometimes we wire a whole village with electricity and put a generator for them. We have built markets in some places, built schools in some areas. That's the kind of mission I belong to. It's called Compassion Ministries. So when we went to Ibwa, we went with some of these things. And by the time the chief of that village, who doubles as the chief imam of the village, the chief priest, by the time he saw what we brought, he told us to sit down. And then he called the, the town crier and told the town crier to go around the town and announce that tomorrow morning, nobody will go to farm. Every indigent must come to the, to the uh, village circle. And that's what happened. That next morning, very early in the morning, mm -hmm. everybody in Ibwa gathered at the, at the square, village square. Mm -hmm. And this Muslim chief made an announcement. He said that God has answered their prayers. He said that God has sent his children to bring civilization and to bring goodness into their community. He reminded them how they have prayed that government to come and help them and how government has failed, but that God has sent his people. So he told them to cooperate with us. The meaning of that word cooperate was to show later, after one week, when we have finished our job. Because by the time we finished our work in their midst, giving them free Medicare, teaching them skills, and doing so many other things, and preaching the gospel at the same time, we had gotten about 200 Muslim converts by the end of the week. And by the end of our program, this chief priest invited me, said I should follow him. And as I followed him, he entered the bush. If it was today, when Boko Haram is cutting the heads of pastors, maybe I wouldn't have agreed to follow him into the bush. But I followed him. And he kept walking until at a point he stopped. He pointed at a plot of land and he said, Pastor, build your church here. I was shocked. An imam giving a pastor land, free land to build a church. I thanked God for that miracle. And then we went ahead immediately because in those rural areas in Nigeria, you don't need to buy cement to build a church. There's a way they mold and fire mud blocks and they are even stronger than cement blocks. Now, it was the Muslim converts themselves that took leave from their farms, went ahead and produced all the blocks we needed. They went ahead and built this church. The only thing that came from outside Ibwa was the roofing sheets, which we bought from Abuja town. A church of over 200 worshippers was built in Ibwa. And that church has, has been strong till today. And today, many other churches have entered Ibwa. What happened? This is an unreached place where Jesus had not been mentioned, but compassion took us there. And compassion won. And today, Ibuwa people are Christians. Put your hand together for Jesus. So talking about the hindrances to reaching the unreached people, the very first one is religious violence and persecution. When we went to Ibwa, this is what we were afraid of, that they could cut up our heads. But God gave us the victory. And instead of violence, what we saw was cooperation. And the people gave their lives to Jesus. 
But in northern Nigeria, especially in the northeast, Boko Haram has held sway over the land and over the people. And religious violence is the order of the day. Similar situations persist in several countries of North Africa, like Egypt, Libya, Tunisia. In these locations, Christian mission is totally unwelcome. Christian mission is violently resisted. Going to preach to people who have not had the, the word of God in those places is like asking for trouble. Again, in Nigeria, it is estimated that Boko Haram has killed about 35,000 people since 2011. Most of them are Christians. In northern Nigeria, Boko Haram walks into pastors' houses and cuts off their heads. Danger. Why? Because you want to reach the unreached. They specifically target Christian communities with destruction and burning of churches, burning of church buildings, abduction of pastors, abduction of individual Christians, rape, assassination of pastors and whole Christian families. It has been happening and it is still happening in northern Nigeria. This religious persecution is a major hindrance to the work of reaching the unreached in Nigeria. So as things are in Nigeria today, most pastors have relocated from Northern Nigeria. Most ministries have closed down their branches, the ones that have not been burnt and destroyed. They closed it down and ran back to Northern Nigeria. The last year, the Lord spoke to me. He said I should speak to the Nigerian church and tell them to go back to the North. Now, this is a message that the Nigerian church does not want to hear. The Lord explained to me that Christian missions is warfare. And that no soldier runs away from the, from the war front for the reason of the fear that he may die. He said a soldier that feels that way, usually in an organized army, that, show, that soldier is shot at home, killed at home. Because before you volunteer for the army, you are already dead. You take yourself as dead. Your family takes you as dead before you go to the war front. So the death of a soldier is not news. But the Lord was showing me that in today's Christianity, we have taken Christianity as a social, social practice. So that anywhere we see danger, we run. But what does the word of God tell us? He says, in trouble, I will be with you. So Christian missions is a search for trouble. It's a search for troubled areas. And God said, tell the church to go back to the north. Much as that is not good news, me that is the bearer of the news, I had to comply by taking missions back to northern Nigeria. And every year for some years now, we find a troubled location in northern Nigeria to go there and preach the gospel, to plant a church, and to teach people that Jesus Christ is Lord. The last time we did that is just about two months ago. Is it two months now or three months ago? No, two months ago. We went to Kaduna. Kaduna is one of the most troubled areas, violence-wise, in Nigeria. Southern Kaduna especially, is where Islam has sworn that Christianity will not thrive. Because though they know Kaduna as a Muslim state, Southern Kaduna is a Christian, Christian area. So every, fine, every kind of violence is meted out on localities in Southern Kaduna. Whole villages are burnt, and they ship in Muslims with trailers to come and occupy the, the, the villages. The economy of Southern Kaduna is destroyed. Any good thing, government will come and bulldoze it. Southern Kaduna is where you hear about all kinds of kidnappings. People will be going along the road and you hear that 30 people have been shot down, travelers. Mm -hmm. They go to churches on Sunday morning and burn down the churches with worshipers inside it. That is Southern Kaduna. It's a place where you, you, should be, you are looking for death if you come there to mention Jesus. But like I said two months ago, 
the Lord compared me and my missions team, Mission State International, which is a, a missions outreach of the charismatic in our ministries, to go to Southern Kaduna. So to go, we made some calls. We called the Directorate of Security Services in Nigeria and told them that we want to go and do Christian missions in Southern Kaduna. They shouted. They said, don't go. And we said, why don't you want us to go? They said, because Southern Kaduna is red in our map. Red means going there is looking for trouble, ordinarily. Not to talk of now going to preach Christ. I mean, do you have sense at all? And I laughed. I told them where we're going. And you know something? We went. But the first testimony of our going is that this most dangerous mission field is the one that attracted the greatest number of mission volunteers. We had over 200 people coming from all over Nigeria to Southern Kaduna to preach Christ. And I was surprised. This is a place where people should be running away from. In fact, some leaders even called me to, to ask, are you mad? Are you? Did you just come back from overseas? Don't you know what is happening in Southern Kaduna? Why are you taking God's people to that place? <laughs> I said, I'm not only taking God's people, I'm taking the army of Christ to that place, and we are going to come back victorious. Then I told them, if, however, we die fighting in Southern Kaduna, just know that we died at our post. Because we have volunteered our lives as missionaries. What are we running away from death for? Have you not heard that it is those who run from death that die? Have you not heard that those who do not value their lives again for the cause of Christ, they are the ones that survive? We went to Southern Kaduna. We planted three churches in three different localities. Jesus came down physically. We won souls in their numbers. Come and see Muslims surrendering their lives to Jesus. We have all of them in tape. And we started churches. And we prayed for Southern Kaduna that God will have mercy on them because they are the grinding points where Muslims just, anytime they feel like killing, they go there and kill. And just about one week after we prayed that prayer, the government in Nigeria appointed a member, a, an indigenous of Satan Kaduna as the chief of, uh, of the army in Nigeria. The chief of the army. So you can imagine anybody looking for trouble in Satan Kaduna He's not looking for the trouble of the army. Put your hands together for Jesus. God answers prayers. Praise the Lord, somebody. So what was it that took us to Southern Kaduna? Jesus' compassion. They were suffering, and God compelled us to go. Left to us, we wouldn't want to go and risk our lives in those places. But it's not left to us. It's left to the Holy Ghost where you do your missions. So those of you who are still going for missions where they want, you have missed it. The Holy Ghost is the chief executive of this mission. He's the one that picks those who must go. He's the one that tells you where to go. I remember the time of Paul. He wanted to go to Arabia, wanted to go to other places. And the Holy Ghost said, no, it's me that will show you where you have to go. So by the time God is putting compassion in your heart, for a section of rich people that are going to discover after this message, just know that God has come for you. He's sending you. You are not to be afraid for your life. And to help you not to be afraid for your life, as the Bible told us, consider yourself as dead. The life you now live, you live it by the grace of Jesus Christ himself. Consider yourself as dead. So if God sends you to the zone of death, just know that you are going there to deliver life. Stop being afraid. No wonder in 365 places, the Bible says, fear not. He was speaking to you, child of God. Stop being afraid. People who are afraid, they die several times before their death comes. Make up your mind, you're a soldier of Christ. Soldiers don't fear to die. Soldiers go to bring light. May the Lord help you using compassion 
to go into those ungoable places to bring the light of Jesus Christ to the people in the name of Jesus. A second reason why the gospel is not thriving in unreached people groups is because of inadequate manpower. And from the little I've already said about how afraid many Christians and many missionaries are, you know why manpower is inadequate. But it's a general phenomenon. Not only because of unreached people groups, but missions has become a non-interesting phenomenon, even within the church circles, missions. When I was growing up, people resigned from oil companies to go into missions. When I was growing up, people resigned as managing directors of big companies to go for missions. But today, even jobless people do not want to go to mission. I remember advertising a vacancy in a mission field outside of my country. And one young man came to ask me, how much are you paying? I want to know what I can go for you. <laughs> I laughed and told him I'm not paying. When I said I'm not paying, I didn't mean that we don't have a stipend for missionaries. We do. But a missionary who's going for the money is not a missionary. Anybody who's going for what he will get out of it is not a missionary. That is the type that will leave the flock and run away when a lion comes. But if you see missionaries who are not out for the money, if you, mission, if you see missionaries who have compassion for the souls, you will see missionaries who will be ready to die for souls. I know the story of one of my missionaries in one of the African countries. During the time of Ebola, by the grace of God, I'm the international mission director for my, for my ministry. So I'm the one that posts missionaries. During the time of Ebola, I called this missionary and I told him, from the news I have of how Ebola is ravaging your country, I think it's time for you to come back with your family. And he laughed and he said, Daddy, I'm not coming back. I said, what do you mean? He said, I cannot leave my people here to come back to Nigeria. I was touched. I said, is your wife around? He said, yes. I said, give the phone to your wife. He gave the phone to his wife. And I said, Madam, I've heard what my husband said, but I want you to pack your things with your children. You can leave your husband there. I want you to come back to Nigeria next week. I'll buy your tickets. And she laughed. She said, Daddy, we have decided we are not coming back. I said, what? Ebola is killing people in thousands on a daily basis. This was the country of Sierra Leone. And you say, you're not coming back. And she said, Lord, Father, we have prayed that God will protect us. But as for leaving our people, we won't leave our people. Who were they calling their people? Technically, their people were in Nigeria. They are missionaries to Sierra Leone. But their people have become the souls they have won. They were so attached, so compassionate, that they were ready to die, the whole family with their children, than to step out. And you know the testimony? In this church, Nobody died throughout the ravaging of Ebola. In fact, three times a church member caught Ebola and they were healed without any other person in their families catching it. Ebola came and left Sierra Leone and nobody died in that church. And I was touched. See what compassion can do to success in ministry. See what bonding. When you hear that Jesus had compassion for them, when you hear that Jesus wept, that's what it takes to get this work done. Not this technical attitude of today's missionaries, where you check whether there is gain in the field, where you check what was the testimony of those who went before you, so that you know whether you can answer to God's call or not. Where you check whether you have the strength, or whether you have enough money, or whether your family will allow you or not allow you, and all kinds of civilian issues that we experience in missions today. Compassion, that's what it takes. I tell you something, there is a state of emergency 
in the work of missions to unleash people today. It's a state of emergency in the area of manpower. To find a true missionary today is like looking for a needle in a hay sack. May God will have mercy on us. Because I'm speaking to somebody tonight who will receive understanding and who will become the kind of mercenary that Jesus is looking for. People who are not looking for where to be safe, but for where to die. They are the ones who will never die. Jesus said so. People who do not care about themselves anymore, but about how the next soul will come into the kingdom. These are the people that Jesus is looking for. Can you imagine the kind of radical Muslims that we have in the world today? Young men and women looking for where to blow themselves up for their God. People who are ready to die. Do you know that the Hamas people that went into Israel a few weeks ago to kill, they did not plan to come back alive. There was no plan of how they would return. They knew they would die. And Israel later announced that they have picked 1,500 bodies of Hamas mercenaries dead inside Israel. All they wanted was to kill a soul for their God. But today we have Christian missionaries who are looking for safe places to relocate to. Today we have places in our towns where every next building is a church. And yet more churches are coming in those places while unrich people, nobody wants to encounter them. I can illustrate this emergency with the following figures from the websites of Within Reach Global. Within Reach Global is a mission website. It gives us an idea of the great imbalance of global missions in the 1040 window. The 1040 window is the domain of most of the unreached people groups all over the world. In that 1040 window, the population of the whole world living in 1040 window is 69%. The population of unreached people groups living in the 1040 window is 63%. Poor people of the world living in the 1040 window is 82%. But do you know that Christian missionaries working in the 1040 window are 3% of all the missionaries all over the world? In this place, that is where the need is much more, that's where only 3% of world missionaries are located. It's an interesting dilemma that in the history of global missions, that Nigeria and Africa, that we are net receivers of missionaries, have over the last decade become net senders. And I thank God for Africa for that. Because today, Europe and America, that we are known as mission sender, they have become mission fields. We don't even have enough missionaries from Africa and Asia to send to Europe and America. Not as if we have finished the work in Africa. It's an emergency situation. More missionaries are required, but not milk drinking missionaries. More diehard missionaries are required. What kind of discipleship are you doing in your church? that is producing the kind of milk generation that we're seeing all over the place? What kind of examples are we showing in our different areas of influence that are producing soldiers who do not want to die? Has it ever been hard in any army, anywhere in the world, that your soldiers do not want to die? What kind of army is that? What kind of army? Another problem of reaching the unreached is the issue of inadequate funding. Inadequate funding. And to illustrate it with that same website I just quoted, do you know that the population and the funding of Christian work in the 1040 window is 1% of missionary funding all over the world? 
in this place that has 82% of poor people all over the world, this place that has 63% 63, 63 of unrich people all over the world, the, the, fund of, the fund of global missions that goes to the 1040 window is 1%. <laughs> so do you say we are serious? So it cannot be overemphasized that the work of reaching the unreached cannot progress without adequate funding, but adequate change to what is happening today. The church must repent. The church must learn to do less of struggles and do more of reaching out to where souls are perishing. This is an emergency. I'm sending you with this emergency in your different countries, in your different churches. I'm sounding the alarm of this emergency because we are at the end times. Jesus is coming soon. And it will not be hard that the devil won the battle for souls. Because as we are today, if we are to look at who is winning the battle for souls, I'm sorry to disappoint you. It is the devil. But we are here to make sure that that statistic changes. Today, the devil has captured more souls than the kingdom of God. But that statistics must change. Why? Because of me and because of you. Two of us are enough to make the difference. Two of us are enough to say, never again. Two of us are enough to show the example that Jesus is Lord. The Bible said, creature is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Where are the sons of God? Where are you manifesting? Is it in preaching the gospel on the altars inside the four walls of a church? No. The warfare is happening in mission fields all over the world. Where souls are perishing in their numbers, where Jesus is not mentioned, where the light is not admitted in nations of the world. And we're eating rice and chicken on a daily basis. God will have mercy on us. This is why revival tarries. I didn't say I shouldn't eat, so I eat. But you better walk as you're eating. God bless you. We also have the problem of inadequate training and training opportunities. That is to say, many of the missionaries we send are not properly trained. And because they are not properly trained, they can't, they don't know what to do faced with difficulties. They don't know what to do in the face of danger. Many of them actually resign and run away when things become tough. Because they, they thought that mission work is just another employment. Missionaries ought to be well trained. I discovered that there's an impatience today of churches and mission organizations to train their people before sending them. There's a, an impatience. Let us be methodical. Let us be intentional in training people well before sending them. When you train a soldier well, he knows what to do in the face of danger. Until we embrace missional training and do it properly before sending people, we may not be able to win this fight. In fact, compassion is enough for you to be careful about who you send. Because sending untrained people is like sending them to their death. So many people do not know what it means to do spiritual warfare. Because they're not trained. And you send such a person to places where the demon manifests in the daytime. And I've gone to places where, if not that the Spirit of God speaks to me and is close to me, I'm close to him rather, I would have died. One of them is a place called uh, uh, Kokrobite in Ghana, where I met the kind of demons I've never met in my life before. And I went to challenge them alone. I went on a, 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 I went to do survey. I didn't go for missions. I just went to survey the area. And by the time I met the kind of demonic activity, I decided to challenge them. I nearly died that day. Something like a bullet passed through my head, unseen. And I reeled, I nearly fell. And I was asking the Holy Spirit, what's happening to me? What's happening to me? And he asked me a question. He said, are you here for the battle? Are you here for survey? <laughs> I laughed at myself that day. 
I apologized to him. And I told that demon spirit I would return. I was like the 12 spies that were sent to go and spy out the land of Canaan. Assuming they went there to start fighting, will they come back? We need to know that in the kind of missions we have in rich places, it's not personal anointing that matters. It is corporate anointing. That is why one of the most important compassion you will have on unreached people is to pray. You pray for them and you pray for the missionaries that are sent to such places. Because what is happening there is spiritual dynamics. Civilians don't thrive in those places. So by the time I came back to Nigeria from that survey, I set up praying teams all over the country in different states because I knew we we're going to confront a, 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 a persistent demonic present manifestation. And we really prayed for three months before we went. And when we went to Kokrobiti, the land bowed before us. In fact, the Holy Spirit told me to go to the shrine of the popular deity. The popular deity in that place is known as the most, the strongest and most wicked witchcraft deity in West Africa. The Holy Ghost said I should go there. And I went there with three other people. And by the time I got there, the whole place was open. I saw only one elderly man of about 80 years and another young man of 20-something years. Two of them were sitting down inside the shrine. And we went, I, I, I confronted the old man. I said, are you the chief priest here? He said, yes. I said, no, I didn't think of these things I'm saying. I just started saying it as I went in. I said, God has sent me to tell you that you will die soon. And by the time you die, you will go to hell because of the wicked work you're doing in this shrine. When I said that, I took a few steps backwards because I've been told that this, this chief priest is the chief priest of the most wicked and strongest witchcraft deity in West Africa. So I had a physical sensibility of where I was standing. I took a few steps backward and began to pray in the spirit. While I was praying in the spirit, waiting for what the man would do, I suddenly discovered that he was crying. I said, what? Am I in the wrong place? I expected more than this. I went closer to the man. I said, are you crying? He said, yes. I said, why? He said, because I was a Christian 35 years ago. But this community forced me to be their chief priest. Now I'm going to die and go to hell. For what? I was confused. I didn't know what next to say. Then I said, do you want to give your life to Jesus? He said, yes. I was surprised. This is not what I expected from a chief priest of the Papla witchcraft date. I took a chair and sat in front of him. And I preached to him and led him to Christ. He gave his life to Christ. I put my hand on his head and prayed out my heart, asking God to accept his soul. And by the time we said amen to that prayer, some seven men walked into the shrine. Now, we didn't know that there is a, a regular security in that shrine. But when the Holy Ghost sent us, he caused them to leave the place. As we said, Amen, they walked back. And just the sight of my hand on top of their chief priest, there was riot in that place. They carried the three young people I'm with and threw them out through the door and window. Their leader ran at me with a clenched fist. Then when he came face to face with me, he just turned and began to hit, began to hit the younger man that was with the chief priest. He said, you are here and this evil is happening. You know, and at that point, like I always say, I discovered that these two legs that God gave us, we use it for more than breaking. So I used it for other things, quickly relocated from the shrine. I won't tell you what I did anyway. But then a month later, the chief priest died. I know he's in heaven today. I know that God sent us for his soul. But what else happened? A few years down the line, Kokrobite, that is the habitation of dark spirits. Kokrobite, that was a place where there was no civilization of any kind. Government identity was not in that place at all, of any kind. Today, Kokrobite, you see four-star hotels you see major routes passing through the location. What happened was that God transformed that location 
after destroying the habitation of witchcraft in that place. What led us there? Compassion. Compassion. What will make you to pray for the UPG, Unreached People Group? Compassion. What will make you to pray for those you are sending to those places? Compassion. Because when you, as a mission sender, send a missionary to a place of trouble and death, you know you have work to do. You must pray. In the ministry where I work, we pray every day for the work of missions and for missionaries. Every day. We have prayer points that we send out every day. And then every Sunday, we gather on Zoom to pray for the work. Every Sunday. We have done this thing for the last one and a half years without fail. And God is helping us. God is answering our prayers. God is saving our missionaries. We are in terrible, dangerous places. God is giving us souls. God is maintaining the souls by himself. Praise the Lord, somebody. So I begin to round off at this point. The answer to effective work among rich people is compassion. Compassion means to empathize with someone who is suffering. Someone who is in need. Compassion compels you to do something about such people. So if you have compassion, it will lead you to those who are suffering, who are dying in darkness. And those who are dying in this darkness are the poorest of this world. They suffer the greatest of sicknesses in this world. They suffer the greatest of neglect anywhere you find them in this world. Empathy, compassion, that's what will drive God's worker to such places. May God find us faithful in reaching out to such people and in doing something about them. If you're a mission organizer, compassion means you should add something to your preaching. It takes compassion to preach in the first case. But add something to your preaching. Add something. Good news to a hungry man is bread, first of all, before you start preaching Christ. Give him bread to eat. In the church where I serve, one of our compassion ministries is baking of bread and giving to the poor. The very first day we bake this bread, I packed 100 loaves of bread in a bag and gave to a staff to take it to a children's, abandoned children's home. And by the time my staff got there with the 100 loaves, the pastor began to cry and called me on phone and I asked him, why are you crying? He said for the last one week, his children, he had about 104 of them in the home, had been asking for bread, but he didn't have money to buy them bread on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday. On Saturday, they asked him for bread again, and his heart broke. He went to his room and searched and found a thousand naira and gave to his son to go and buy four loaves of bread to give to the children who are craving for bread. But ask me, what will four loaves of bread do for 104 children? But he said, as his son was returning with the four loaves of bread, my staff was coming in with 100 loaves. That's why he began to cry. He said, Pastor, it was God that sent you to, to bring us the bread. And that thing affected me seriously, affected me deeply. The feeling that we are sent, uh, the testimonies of when the compassion of Jesus sends you is wonderful. It's wonderful. So if you're a mission sender, even if you're just a church pastor and you're doing evangelism, learn to do something for the poor. Jesus cares for them. Learn to do something for the needy. Jesus came for them. The widows, the orphans. They are the ones that Jesus came for. These are the days when we make money in church and some buy jets, build mega buildings of all kinds, all kinds of equipment. I'm not against any of them, but I want to ask you, what of the poor? What of the needy? I mean, through compassion, not the one you put on TV for everybody to see what you're doing. True compassion. Working hand in hand with Jesus to reach those who are in need. This is the need of the hour. 
Those who are in need are part of the unreached. In places of affluence, you will see the very, very poor in those same localities. The dregs of society. They end up smoking hard drugs, drinking themselves to stupor as a way of forgetting their suffering. But the church is living in their midst. Can we do more? Can we allow the compassion of Jesus that made him weep to touch our hearts? Can we do more than just preach the gospel? Can we give? Can we help? Can we reach out? May God bless us as we decide to do that. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I will hand over to the convener, Pastor Light, to lead us to pray for the few minutes that we have left. God bless you. Mm, I'm speechless. I'm speechless. I wish we could hear grace and let individuals go and pray. That necessity demands that we pray some corporate prayers. What is going on in my heart here is just like God said to me that the Global Harvest Prayer Network first three years we are preparatory stage. Preparatory stage. And that as we do the celebration of the four, third year anniversary on Saturday, we should have stepped into the next phase. And this next phase, the message we just heard now is so fitted and so fitting into it. Servant of God, it's not by accident that you are listening to this discussion. Even those who will be privileged to hear this after now, and those on Facebook, is not by accident. Look at the percentage of missionaries that are concentrating on the on which people groups. You go to some countries, you see massive population of believers, like Dr. Imajo was saying. People are jumping from one church to another. And you go to some areas, it's like a whole desert. If God calls you home today, or let's say a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and bring out this teaching and play it before you, and ask you, did you hear this? You say, yes, sir. What did you do with it? After my servant spoke by my inspiration, what did you do with it? That implies a question is confronting every one of us. What do you do with what you have heard? What will you make out of this? I remember when I was sitting under Dr. Imajo many years ago, I first heard the word. Please, can you meet everybody? I'm hearing a strange noise, please. I heard from him for the first time that there are three categories of you know, harvesters. Jesus said the, 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 the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. He said there are three categories of laborers. 
the goers, the givers, and groaners. The givers, the goers, and the groaners. There are some, for a number of reasons, they are not able to go, but they can groan. They can bend their knees. They can back on unusual prayer, you know, sacrifices through the night and through the day. Some can give. They may not be able to go, but they can give. I was talking to a man a couple of weeks ago. He said to me that he entered into a covenant with God that whatever he gives to him, he will pay the opposite. Instead of paying 10%, he will give 90%, 90%. And that God told him that if you keep to that, the 10% you are keeping back, I will so enlarge it that you won't be able to know what to do with it for yourself for taking such a decision. A few days ago, he was telling me how he, he wants, he is passionate about this and that and that. And I was looking at him. The question is, you, that the only money that comes into your hands in a month, maybe 5,000 rands or 2,000 rands, what are you doing with that little? God is placing a demand on everyone that heard this message. For me, it's like, this is for me alone, but I believe it's for everyone. What will you do? We can say, let's pray now. Good. At the end of the prayer, we share grace and go. But what have you decided to do with what you have heard? With respect to developing compassion for the lost and for the needy. Compassion for the lost and for the needy. Taking bold steps, courageous steps. A servant of God was saying the other day that people say they are doing night vigil to pray for power. God, give me power. God, give me power. He says, shut up your mouth. You don't need power. What you need is boldness. What you need is courage. If you ask Dr. Majo how he felt, the going to confront some of these shrines, some of these deadly places he went to, 99% or something percent Islamic society, he went in there, confronted the people, and what was your confidence level, or rather, how do I put it, did you pray for more power? You, what? It was not about power, it is about courage. Courage. I do tell people, Jesus says you shall pick up serpent and it will not bite you, it will not hurt you. But you can try it in church one day. Find a way to bring one serpent and throw it among pastors, not even church, just gathering of pastors. You see how people break, use their head to break the door, running, even though they know the scriptures. They know the power is there. But what we lack is courage. The truth remains that Christ is not happy to see one sinner, one sinner from Egypt, from Afghanistan, from Kuwait, from Saudi Arabia, these are tough Islamic nations, from Yemen and all those regions. He is not pleased to see one of them die and go to hell. What do we do? We need people who will take the risk to bend their knees to pray, who are willing to overlook their wickedness, overlook their wickedness, and seek with the compassion of Christ their salvation. I say that because from my dealings with pastors and ministers of the gospel, I've come to see that if salvation is in our hand, it is within our power to control who is saved and who is not saved we will not give salvation to some people. We will make sure they don't get it. 
they need to perish. We need to change our ways and love the way Christ loves. See the way Christ sees. So, who will go for us? Who will step out of his or her comfort zone and go into the hardcore society where Christianity is found at, resisted, and is a taboo to mention Christ? I'm not quick to pray. I don't even know if I want to pray. Because I want this to sink into our spirit. How much of your income do you want to give to missions? How much of your income will you prepare to use to help missionaries? There is a minister here, one of my friends here. He runs a church in Cape Town. To the best of my knowledge, just one church. And somehow he found himself go to Pakistan. Within 10 years, he has started 57 churches. Within 10 years, he has started 57 churches. How? Just few converts he won in that country and they literally took over the land. One day I was talking with him, he, the man called, the overseer there called, say, sir, we are in the most dangerous part of Pakistan. Very, very risky place. We are there right now. I'm calling you from there. Say, what are you doing there? Say, we are planting the church number 58. Church, is it either church number 57 or church number 58? In the most dangerous place. And he told me that the little money they sent from South Africa to that place is like heaven dropping man from above. What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your resources? What are you doing with the connections you have? The greatest thing you can achieve in your lifetime is that you do the gospel to where people resisted it. You prevailed on them. You conquered them and you planted that world. Some of you may not be going out there, but you are called into administration. I want to use this opportunity to thank all of you who have been into the admin team of the Global Harvest Prayer Network. I mean, there are some things that are done here. I don't know how it has been done. Some people just emerged, took it upon themselves to make sure things are done and done well. I can't thank you enough. Eternity and even life on this earth will reward you. Thank you. But my God, we thank you more. So we're going to pray. Three prayers the Lord laid in my heart. And please, if you don't mean this, don't pray this prayer. If you are not serious about it, don't pray. But if you are going to join me to make this prayer, get ready to take action. Number one, Lord, baptize me with this kind of compassion I heard from your servant. Lord, plug me into the same source of courage, of boldness, of power, of sacrificial donation of myself to you, sacrificial donation of myself to you. Convenient Christianity is one of the undoing of the church. A man of God was talking with me last month and said something that has troubled me. He said, pastor, he said, pastors, pastors, have hijacked the purpose of the church. Say, so what do you mean? And he gave me analysis. Say, so pastors have hijacked the purpose of the church. The church was not meant to be an entertainment place. The church is meant to be a military cantonment where people are packed, are shaped, equipped, trained, and sent into the, the war zone. 
to conquer the world. And that was how they started. Hence, many were killed brutally. The more you kill them, the more the church was growing. But today, anywhere they are not even killing, anywhere do you won't have enough money, you run away from that place. And look for where it is much easier to have a good life. Because Christianity of today is measured by how, how flourishing you are, how materially successful you are. That's the measure of the goodness of God, the presence of God, the anointing of God upon a woman and upon a man. Who will go? Who will go? Who will give? Who will clean himself? Who will sanctify himself? One of the things the Lord said to me, which I'm supposed to be preaching this evening, but I just feel like not preaching. He said, consecration for global revival. Consecration for global revival. Consecration for global revival. All these things we're talking about here, you dare not go into that field if you are still meddling with sin. You dare not go that far if you are still wearing the old garment. The new wine must be the new wine skin. Examine yourself. It's not about condemning yourself. Examine yourself and know which of the old garment to cast away, which lifestyle to cast away, which attitude to cast away, which extravagant life to cast away, which life of pleasure and frivolities to throw off your ways. Review your life. When your life on earth shall be over, you will only be remembered by the impact you made in the life of people. How you help people to find Christ, how you help community to find Christ, how you helped and enrich people to receive the light, the grace, the goodness of God. Shall we call upon God to help us? Prayer number two, Lord, Grant me access to resources. Grant me access to resources. Grant me access to resources. Grant me willingness to go to where people don't want to go. And resources to go. I know there are some people here, when God grants them financial empowerment, they will touch nations. They will touch communities. They will touch people. Whatever is withholding resources and flowing in your direction, whatever is blockaging resources from reaching you, the money we need to expand this kingdom, to spread this gospel, to conquer territories globally, I mean globally, these monies are sitting somewhere and the devil doesn't want it to get to the hands of the righteous. But it is too late for the devil. I know that I know that I know that we are heading to a season where you as a person, me as a person, will want to go for mission and we will have more than enough resources for it. Whatever God will do to release resources, he will do it. 2024 is a year of mission extravaganza. 2024, don't forget this, is a year of mission outreaches in a dimension that is frightening, that is unbelievable, that is scary, that is unthinkable, that you can't even imagine it. I see the body of Christ rising with compassion for the lost in a way that within one year, within one year, 
the army of God will do what the church could not do in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, in one year. It will be as a result of understanding eternity, the content of eternity. Because no man, no woman who understands eternity, who understands eternity, will leave the, 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 the convenient Christianity we are living today. Any man that has a grip, a glimpse, an understanding of what eternity holds, we preach differently. We pray differently. Lifestyle different. In all areas, he or she will be different. Why? Because he is seeing eternity. Others are seeing materialism of today, pleasures of today. So, God wants to change our vision take away our vision and give us his vision, his vision for the nations of the world. That's what is happening. And it is my prayer that you will be in touch with what God is doing. Cleaning people so that they will be vessel, dependable, usable, usable for the master's passion. May God grant you grace to clean up your life. God said to me yesterday, tell my people, are they ready for all of me? Are they ready for all of me? That voice hasn't left me since yesterday. Are they ready for all of me? Every one of us have had encounter of different dimensions of God. We have encountered different dimensions of God. But he said, I want to give all of me to each of you. Because I want to fill all of you with my fullness so that you can stand out and stand up and look at the nations from my own point of view. See the nations from God's point of view. With eternity in view, you look at the nations again. It will change your understanding, or rather, it will change your, 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 your response to the things that pertain to the lost. It's not about your denomination. It's not about your, 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 your personal ambition. It's about what God is saying regarding the nations of the world with view of eternity. Having said that, I want you to pray. If you ask me to give prayer points here, we will pray till 12 midnight. So I will leave you to pray. But in this prayer, three things or four rather, Lord, give me this kind of boldness that was with the apostles. That when it, they were not looking, of course, in those days, there was not Christianity as it is today. So everywhere was like, you know, unreached people group. The whole world was unreached. So like Dr. Majo was saying today, the different unreached people groups we have today, that's how it was in the days of Paul. And they took risk. They took risk and they broke into those places and turned the nations upside down, established the kingdom of God where there was never such mention. So God, give me this boldness. Give me this courage. Cause me to begin to see what I need to see because of what price you paid on the cross. God, open resources. Give us divine connection to wealth. Touch people who have this wealth. They don't know what to do with it. Let them bring it to the missionaries who have vision of what to do. There are quite a number of such missionaries here. I see people from India. I see people from Pakistan. I see people from different parts of the world who are connected to this meeting and their heart is craving for something strong to reach out to their people. God, release resources to me. Give me idea to create wealth. Give me idea to create wealth. Idea to create wealth. And the seed, the seed to start up that wealth creation. So having the idea, don't have the seed, it limits you. Give me the idea, give me the seed, and guide me. Number three or four, I want you to ask God, 
to lead you to where he wants you to be, either a goer, a groaner, or a giver. Like he said, you don't just carry your luggage and you want to go to some place. For information, missionary activities, both geographical and also, um, what's the right word now? Um, there are people groups within the city of Cape Town, for instance, that are unreached. They live in Cape Town, they live in Lagos, they live in Port Harcourt, they live in, Lon live in London, where it is presumably Christian, but they are not rich. Street people, prostitutes, drug addicts, billionaires. You know, it's funny to say that there are some billionaires, there are some politicians that people are afraid to take the gospel to them because they don't know what to say. I met with a politician years ago. He said to me, and then some traditional rulers I met within that period also, each of them said to me, thank you for coming. That most pastors lack the courage to come to us to preach to us. And some of them, when they come, they will not tell us the truth raw through that could convict us and save us the way you did. They rather come to shower praises or not so that we give them money. I was so ashamed of, 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 of the priesthood that misrepresent, I mean, misrepresent God. It is my prayer that you will discover a people that are not yet reached. You discover people within your city who are not reached. There are a number of them. They are not reached. Some of the superstars, maybe those who are into entertainment industry, very prominent, very great people, nobody bothers to reach out to them. But some of these people, if they catch the gospel, you can imagine the speed with which they will spread it all over the world. God, open my eyes to see people I can reach with the gospel within the life I still have, within my time on earth, when I'm still strong, when I can still talk, I can still stop, walk, I can still move. Help me, show me people that I must take the gospel to. That's why the pastor said to me that pastors have hijacked the purpose of the church. Instead of equipping people to go out and expand the kingdom, People are being bred and are being spoon feed, what do you call it, spoon, spoon fed to just come to church and sing songs and dance and give offering and give tithe and go back home. Full stop. No, sir. We have gone past that level. The nations must be reached. So go ahead and pray. You cannot meet yourself enough. I mean, a word is enough for the wise. Or meet yourself and pray. God, rewind my brain, reconstruct my brain, and show me the right path. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank 
Heavenly Father, we join our hand. Can you please stretch out your hand as though we are all holding our hand together? Father, we join our hands together with the hand of the pioneers of revival, the patriarchs, the apostolic army, the men that hazarded their life, that gave up their life, that the gospel might spread across the globe. We hold hand with them. The fathers of the faith, the mothers of the faith, who sold their life as a seed for the kingdom of God to conquer the world, we hold our hand with them. And we surrender ourselves to you. We receive the button from them. We receive the button from them. We receive the button of mission. We receive the baton of revival. We receive the baton of conquering nations. We receive that baton. And we stand up. And we stand out. And we say, Lord, count on us. Count on us. Help us to clean our life. To clean our ways. To throw away weights that are slowing us down that are wearing heavy on us, that are distracting us, religious weight, and all kinds of weights, carnality, worldliness, hypocrisy, pride, all kinds of immorality, all kinds of fear, fear of taking steps, fear of financial difficulty, Fear of satanic power. Fear of what people will say. Fear of the unknown that is restoring the church globally. Making the church to cluster where the church is already concentrating. Father, we receive grace to break all those distractions, to break all the chains, to break everything that has kept the church at a spot to move into the nations to move into the cities, 
to move to the communities, to move into the islands, to move into the villages, to move into the mega cities, move into all categories of people to magnify Jesus. This is our mission. This is our life. You will help us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Glory.